Gary Dalsing just completed his fifth and final stereotactic radiation treatment for prostate cancer. Conventional radiation treatments for prostate cancer are much longer. 40 plus treatments over eight weeks. It was five times a week for 40 plus treatments. Gary chose the University of Kansas Cancer Center, the first and only treatment center in the metro to offer stereotactic radiation to prostate cancer patients. Everybody does not have the technology to do this. So far the data has shown that it's very good treatment. It's a great benefit to the patient, you know, less hardship on them. As for Gary and his prognosis? He's doing great. He's done very well with the treatment. It's a kind of a win-win for both us and the patient. Put it the way they put it, if after this treatment, prostate cancer won't be what kills you. <laughs> Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Hi, I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, and with me are Drs. Alan Chen, who is the chairman of radiation oncology and also a head and neck uh, radiation oncologist, and Dr. Melissa Mitchell, uh, who is a breast radiation oncologist at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Today we're discussing radiation oncology and the advances we're seeing in this area of treatment. Radiation therapy, also called radiotherapy, is a cancer treatment that uses high doses of radiation to kill cancer cells and shrink tumors. Radiation therapy will sometimes be used on its own, and in some cases will be used alongside other cancer treatments, such as chemotherapy. Approximately 60% of people being treated for cancer in the United States will receive radiation therapy. So Dr. Chin, what exactly is radiation therapy and how does it work against cancer? Yeah, so radiation therapy is really taking high energy x-ray beams and harnessing, harnessing their abilities to sterilize cancer cells. And so with a lot of the machines and sophisticated technology we have these days, we can really sculpt and shape uh, radiation beams that are emanated from high energy uh, machines uh, used and we can direct them at cancer cells and the radiation causes the DNA of the cancer cells to become damaged to the point where they no longer can be uh, viable or divide and that ultimately leads to uh, tumor cell uh, killing. Hmm. So what are the different types of radiation that can be used uh, in therapy? Yeah, so the most common kind of, of radiation is what we call external beam radiation, and it's radiation that's generated from a, a sophisticated uh, machine, and the beams are targeted at a particular area of the body, naturally where the tumor sits. Um, that is a very effective way of delivering radiation um, from an external source. The other way of delivering radiation is via an internal source called brachytherapy, that's where uh, radiation uh, sources are implanted, uh, usually manually, into a patient's uh, body. Uh, the radiation beams are, are discharged and kill the cancer from the inside out. Uh, and we know that both forms of radiation have a long track record of success in eradicating cancer cells dating back to the last century. So one of the hottest topics in radiation uh, therapy right now is so-called de-escalation. How does that benefit uh, patients? So de-escalation um, arises largely from this um, phenomenon of precision medicine that's sort of taking on oncology um, in a very uh, popular fashion. And uh, precision medicine is really using um, the biology uh, and the individual characteristics of, of a tumor to, um, to tailor uh, therapy. So rather than a one-size-fits-all approach where every patient with breast cancer or every patient with head and neck cancer gets the exact dosage of radiation. We are really using the um, individual biology and genetic characteristics uh, so that every patient gets a different kind of a radiation regimen. And so de-escalation is really analyzing the biology and for some people who we can identify as having a, a more favorable cancer or a less aggressive cancer, we can cut back on the radiation dose accordingly and, and hence optimize quality of life. 
So if you're just joining us, we're talking about advances in radiation oncology treatment at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. As always, Alicia Miller is here in the studio to take your questions. Remember to share this link with people you think might benefit from our discussion. Use the hashtag bench to bedside. So Dr. Mitchell, uh, as a breast cancer specialist, can you tell us about the approach that you take uh, when uh, preparing a treatment plan uh, for one of your patients? Sure, so uh, that's a great question. I was actually approached by an outside surgeon the other day uh, who was at a hospital outside of KU, and I said, it's so great to meet you. I know we've had mutual patients, and she said, oh, that's because I send my patients to whichever radiation center is closest to their home. It doesn't really matter uh, where they get their breast radiation treatment, and I think that's unfortunately what a lot of people think is that radiation treatments are all the same, um, but really, being a breast specialist, which I'm very fortunate to be at KU so that I can just focus on one side. I don't have to think about how do I treat a prostate cancer and how do I treat head and neck cancer. I can really think about the nuances of breast specific treatment. When I go to breast meetings, I go specifically to the talks where I can meet with other people at academic institutions across the country and see what are they doing. And we don't just talk about what are the guidelines. We say, hey, how should we change the guidelines? And so we're really keeping ahead of the curve by having this breast-specific expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started here, I remember I had a somewhat senior resident come in my office and I had taught them kind of how I learned during fellowship to do breast cancer planning. And they said, you know, you should stop trying to be like a head and neck radiation oncologist. You know, I know they spend hours at night contouring, but you know, breast radiation, that's so simple. You just let the dosimetrists do it. Those are the people that plan the radiation treatment. And you just go in there when they're done and you say, looks good, you don't even look at it and you walk back out the door. And I held my ground, I said, no, this is how we're changing things at KU, we're gonna start drawing out the specific areas that we need to treat, drawing out the specific areas we need to avoid, and then making sure that the radiation goes to the right place. And there's lots of things that machines that Dr. Chen talked about, there's lots of things about those machines and the software that we use that can help shape that radiation. So once we have those targets in place that we wanna treat, we can manipulate the angle of the radiation beam a degree at a time so that we can get the maximal separation between the target volumes and the things that we wanna protect. We can also use what we call a multi-leaf collimator, and that's a big fancy word that basically means big metal blocks that are on little motors inside the machine. And those can shape the radiation to within a millimeter so that we can block out the things we don't wanna treat and get maximal dose to the areas that need treatment. And so by having the resident and myself really draw out those areas ahead of time, it helps us to get the radiation to the right place. Um, and then that same resident, actually he came back towards the end of his um, time in our department when he's about to graduate and as asking me all these little nuanced questions about breast cancer treatment planning and I said well John you know I thought that you weren't going to go out and contour this when you became a faculty <laughs> you were just going to let the dosimetrist do it and he said oh goodness no you know now I realize how important it is to actually know where your target is and how much change you can make by changing the beam energy or changing the shape of the beam so we spend hours on each patient really making as Dr. Chen said it's a precision medicine. Mm -hmm. um, each patient, it's based on their anatomy. You know, when I first started, the way that they planned their treatment for patients who had positive lymph nodes, every patient, angle the beam 10 degrees off the spinal cord, use six MEV energy photons and prescribe a three centimeter depth. Well, some people have their lymph nodes at two centimeters, some have them at five centimeters, some surgeons take out 40 lymph nodes, some take out three. You really have to take into account so many factors and it's not just the radiation planning, it's all the prep work too. So clinically we go into that patient's chart. I go and I look at all the images myself that that patient's had, their MRI, their mammogram, their CT scan. Sometimes I find things that radiologists just missed that are important for my treatment. For instance, sometimes we'll see lymph nodes under the chest bone that just mm. weren't caught before. And so I'll go ahead and give those extra radiation dose. Then I'll look at the PATH report and I'll scan through it, looking at things that the chemo doctor doesn't care about, but is important for my treatment where I need to put that radiation dose. And then I'll see things on the pathology report that don't make sense, and I'll go to the operative report and see what did the surgeon do? Did they take the layer of tissue between the chest wall and the breast? If they did, then the margin might make not as much difference, and mm -hmm. sometimes I'll have to call them up. But I do that because it's a difference between five extra treatments or not, and that can cause a lot of difference in toxicity. So really, again, it's very much customized precision medicine that takes a lot of time to 
do. It's not something that we can just turn on the radiation beam and start going. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you tell us about um, the so-called uh, deep inspiration uh, um, uh, breath holding uh, technique and how that benefits patients? Yes, yeah, so that was something I learned about during fellowship. You know, historically patients with left-sided breast cancer, that heart lies right underneath that breast tissue. And with the older techniques where we just aim mm -hmm. the radiation through one side of the breast and out the other, we had no regard to whether or not the heart was laying right in that field. Now, just by looking at your CAT scan that we get for radiation planning, you can change that angle a little bit, but anatomically, the best thing to do is this deep inspiration breath hold. So with that, what happens when a patient takes a deep breath in, their lungs expand outwards. That breast tissue moves with it, and the mm -hmm. breast tissue moves out away from the heart. The other thing that happens is the lungs expand downwards, and the heart's attached to that, so the lungs pull the heart down out of the way of the radiation field as well. Mm -hmm. So we have patients that it moves the radiation beam five centimeters away from the heart, whereas before it would have been treating straight through. Um, the other benefit is it expands the volume of the lung, so the percentage of lung that's actually in the treatment field is much less, sometimes half the amount of lung dose that we would have if we didn't do the deep inspiration breath hold. And all these things mean less dose to the heart, less dose to the lungs. We know from long-term studies from prior treatments when we didn't do this that 1% of patients were having heart attacks and heart failure because of the radiation treatments. And now we can tell patients that with these modern techniques, doses for left-sided patients are the same as right-sided patients. That's some great, uh, great information. So uh, what trends uh, are you seeing in terms of radiation therapy for uh, breast cancer patients? Where, where's the field moving? Well, as Dr. Chen mentioned, this precision medicine and this dose de-escalation are huge right now in the breast cancer world. Again, when I first started, anyone that needed radiation for breast cancer, whether they were a stage zero or a stage three, everyone got six weeks of radiation therapy. There was no differentiation. And everyone got radiation therapy. If you had a lumpectomy, you had to have radiation treatment. But now we're seeing patients um, there's multiple trials open in our clinic right now, and there's patients that get six weeks, patients get five weeks, patients get four, patients get three. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really based, like he said, on the tumor biology, the type of surgery that you've had, all these different factors that I talked about when we look through their chart clinically. And the benefit of all of these therapies is that they're really allowing us to minimize the toxicity as well. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started, I thought six weeks was the right answer. I had older radiation oncologists I was working with, and they said, well, if you have someone that you're really worried about side effects, actually, let's go with eight weeks, because mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe just be a little bit more gentle with radiation, spread it out more. But then in 2012, I went to a meeting, uh, San Antonio Breast Con Conference Symposium, which is kind of the international known conference for breast cancer, all the new guidelines come out there, and I saw a talk from the UK where they presented their 10-year data on short-course radiation therapy, mm -hmm. giving just three to four weeks of radiation therapy. And their results were amazing. Even though they were going faster with their radiation doses, they were seeing less uh, toxicity both in the short term and the long term. So mm -hmm. they weren't seeing as much skin reaction during the treatment, so not as many sunburns. And then in the long term, they were seeing less impact on the appearance of the breast, um, which is a big deal when you're a cancer oh, patient. Yeah. And so there was that factor, the fact that there was less toxicity, but then also the ability to control the tumor was just as good, if not better, in that data set. And that's really something you don't see much in medicine. Usually when you have a therapy that's more aggressive and gets better tumor control, you see more toxicity. Mm. But this was one time when we didn't. So I came back and I said, this is the way we're gonna treat all our patients. So we've done that here for five years, the short course hypofractionated radiation therapy. And just this month in our um, kind of Society Journal, they published the new guidelines on treatment of early stage breast cancer, which says every patient now with early stage breast cancer, three to four weeks of radiation, they should not be getting any more treatment, so. Great. So if you're just joining us, we're talking with Drs. Alan Chen and Melissa Mitchell about advances in radiation oncology treatment. Um, um, Dr. Chen, could you tell us um, uh, where you see uh, the field of, of radiation oncology 10 to 15 uh, years uh, from now? Yeah, so I see radiation oncology moving in two different directions in terms of advances, and Dr. Mitchell touched upon a lot of these, but we have, you know, radiation oncology is a heavily uh, physics-backed field mm -hmm. dependent on advances in, in, in engineering, and so I think we're just starting to really appreciate how precise we can deliver the radiation anywhere in the human body mm -hmm. up to the level of millimeters precision and that's just going to improve with advances in, in engineering. 
I think even now when uh, radiation is delivered, we're always worried about collateral damage, you know, ent entrance and exit dose from the radiation beam. And although we have some techniques now, such as the, the respir respiratory gating techniques that Dr. Mitchell alluded to, it's still not perfect. And I think in the future, with continued advances in, in radiation and, and improvements in how we sculpt and shape radiation beams, we can probably cut that collateral damage down to near zero in the future, where side effects such as second malignancies, uh, for breast cancer, you're talking about you know, damage to the, uh, to the coronary arteries and to the heart itself, or even to the normal lungs. I think all of that um, will uh, be improved with advances in engineering. And I think the other piece of the pie, which is just, if not more important, is learning how to uh, consider biological uh, understandings and in, in integrating those into the field of radiation oncology. Um, you know, as you know, being a pathologist, we're just starting to really understand tumor biology and what all the genomics and molecular signatures and how that impacts um, uh, how a tumor grows or, how, or in, in our case, how a tumor responds uh, to radiation. And so, as Dr. Mitchell um, alluded to, as recently as five years ago, if you had breast cancer, everyone got the same radiation. It was automatic slam dunk, six weeks of radiation, really no variability. Mm -hmm. And it was like that for head and neck cancer, gastric cancers, uh, brain tumors, pediatric cancers. It was a very cookbook sort of recipe mentality in terms of how radiation is delivered. And I like to refer to that, to that as sort of the dark ages of radiation, where we weren't really incorporating the biology or the genomics or the molecular characteristics of, of tumors. And with the explosion of knowledge that has really um, taken place in those areas over the last decade or so, radiation uh, is starting to catch up now. And so, the, you know, we're getting this information from the pathologist. You know, in the past, we would just look at the pathology report. We see a diagnosis of tumor. Carcinoma, and that's all really it took. All right, turn on the radiation machine, everyone's going to get six weeks of radiation. But now we're looking at the pathology report, and there are you know, dozens of pieces of information in the pathology report, various biomarkers, various cellular uh, markers. Many times we'll call the pathologist and ask for more detailed explanations, or it's not uncommon for us to walk over to the pathology lab and actually look at the slides themselves, because all that information is useful in terms of how we can individualize and tailor the radiation. So I think it's a very exciting time in radiation oncology and in the future we're going to continue to make advances in terms of personalized uh, radiation oncology.